the light of Christ illuminate our hearts and minds this second Sunday of Lent. Welcome to our service of worship this morning. Two weeks ago, we began the season of Lent, the 40-day period that leads us to the cross and the empty tomb. Today, we celebrate the second Sunday of Lent, for some a time of fasting and reflection, facing our temptations and giving things up. If we must give things up for Lent this year, could we maybe give up anger and harsh words, negativity and impatience, grudges and complaints? Instead, this year in particular, let us reflect less on those things that we've had to give up and more on the many blessings we already have, the things that we can be grateful for. And let us be silent and prayerful. Let us pray. God of the journey, we have slipped into a new season, a journey to Jerusalem. As we dare to take this Lenten journey, we pray that you will go with us. We know that the way is often full of temptations and difficult decisions, yet each step holds the possibility of hope and transformation. Compassionate Creator, you scatter signs of your mercy along our wandering way. We take courage knowing that Jesus is our pilgrim guide, and thus we do not travel this Lenten season on our own. We pray in the name of Jesus, our companion, to whom with you and the Spirit, one God, be honor and praise now and forever. And now, as you like, in your hearts and silently, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, welcome again on this second Sunday of Lent. Let's take a few minutes today to look at the event that immediately followed Jesus' baptism. Now, I know we've already talked about his baptism, but we need to look at the next event that followed, and that would be temptation. Mark tells us that they both occurred in preparation for his ministry. Two things were necessary for Jesus to begin that ministry that would last just three years. The first, he needed to be baptized. The second, he needed to be tempted. I know that sounds odd. So listen, though. The Spirit descends upon him, and that same Spirit immediately leads him into the wilderness of temptation. No sooner had he been filled with the Spirit than he faced the need to rely on that same Spirit to resist temptation. I think the Gospel writer is doing this for a reason. I think they want us to know that while Jesus was truly divine, he was definitely human. Because God can't be tempted, but Jesus certainly could. And we hear Mark say, immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. The Spirit impelled him. Now, if you translate the Greek for that, it literally means to throw or to shove or to cast out. He's driven by the very Spirit that has recognized him as the Son of God and then must rely on that same Spirit. The inference here isn't that Jesus thought it would be a good idea to go out into the desert, wander around with no food, with the wild beasts, no water, and have Satan tempt him. That wasn't it at all. I think it was truly that it actually says the Spirit 
thrusts Jesus out into the Judean wilderness with no food and no water to be tempted so that he would understand the ministry he was about to undertake. <clears throat> three words, three key words, wilderness, temptation, and 40. Why are they so important? I think it's because we see them all through the Bible, the whole Bible. These three words occur in the Exodus generation as they came out of Egypt. Remember, they were in the wilderness, wandering for 40 years, and they were tempted. And the word tempt means to lure someone into sin. Remember Adam, the first man? Well, he was certainly tempted, and he disobeyed, so he failed. Abraham was given a promise from God that one day he would have a son, but he'd have to wait. And he was tempted not to. And then when he had Isaac, well, God asked him to do something incredibly difficult in the wilderness with Isaac. But he wasn't tempted. He obeyed, and Isaac was spared. Joseph saw a vision from God. He had to endure the test of captivity. He was tempted not to go along, but his faith held him strong. Moses was in the wilderness, remember, for 40 years, wandering, and his people were tempted. He went on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, received the Ten Commandments, and the people of Israel were tempted, and they failed. Noah was on his ark for 40 days and 40 nights, a test of his faith, and his family grumbled but his faith held him strongly. And Mark tells us that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. And of all the images in the Old Testament and the New, 40 is the most important, I think, because it reveals a relationship with God full of promises. How are we tempted? I'm sure during these pandemic times, we've all been tempted to just give in a little bit. So many do's, so many don'ts. It would be easier just to, well, give it up for a while because we're tired of all of it. But don't give up and don't give in. You see, Lent is not about giving things up, but reflecting on the things good or otherwise, that have tempted us, that have challenged us, and that we've been able to walk through and overcome. And why? Because we know something, something that a lot of other people don't know. God is always there with us. Be still, listen, and you will understand. And think about it. When have you felt that you've been in the wilderness? When have you felt tempted? You see, it's not about chocolate all the time. As we listen for the Word of God today, our scripture lesson is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. This is the baptism and temptation of Christ. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Reading our gospel lesson this morning about Jesus' temptation, I'm reminded of the ways in which temptation manifests itself. Little Johnny had to stand in the corner at school for putting mud in the little girl's mouth. His mother was horrified when she heard about it. Why in the world did you put mud in Margaret's mouth? She asked him. Well, said little Johnny, shrugging his shoulders, it was open. 
And then there was the recent article in Maclean's magazine about a Vancouver women's group that had been formed to pressure supermarkets to remove candy from their checkout lines because it was way too tempting for their children and probably tempting for them as well. I have a personal experience with temptation. When I was nine years old, my family flew to England to visit with my mother's family. We stayed with her older brother, my uncle Bernard, who had, she liked to tell me, a little bit of the devil in him. My uncle was the only brother amongst six sisters, so you can imagine he loved teasing and tormenting them as they were growing up. One evening during our visit, and as we sat around the formal dining room table eating our custard slices, and there's nothing better than that, Uncle Bernard watched with unusual fascination as his eldest son ate around the whipped cream on his plate. Now, if you've ever had real English clotted cream, you know that it is incredible. So he left this wonderful wad of clotted cream on his plate to the very end and just as he dipped his spoon into it and was preparing to bring it to his mouth my uncle Bernard swooped in and pushed the unsuspecting lad's hand into his face and left him stunned and nose deep in whipped cream. The five younger siblings broke into hilarity and Alistair exited in a huff and my uncle looking a little sheepish looked over at my aunt and my mother and said, the devil made me do it. There's just too many temptations for all of us. On Ash Wednesday, we began the season of Lent. That's the 40-day period that takes us to the cross and the empty tomb. On this second Sunday of Lent, we find ourselves in the wilderness and that is where the Spirit drives Jesus, according to Mark's Gospel. Perhaps while forced into the wilderness by the Spirit, it could be a time of self-examination for Jesus. Perhaps he knew this would be the last opportunity he would have to truly be alone. Regardless, it was in the wilderness that Jesus was tempted. And there comes a time when we are all tempted. None of us have ever escaped some form of temptation, and some are tempted more than others. Temptation takes many forms. Not telling the cashier that they've given you too much change. Taking that extra slice of pie at supper, knowing darn well it's not good for you. Giving in and giving up on a cause that you know you can make a difference in, but you've just decided it's too much. Yielding to temptation often means giving up convictions because it's just easier to give in. A colleague of mine shared a story in plenary one day, a sad story about something that happened in her women's Bible study group. She'd asked the group, have any of you ever faced temptation? But with Jesus' help, resisted. And a young woman who was attending for the first time raised her hand. Now, Verlene was different from the, from the other women in the group because well, she came from a rather rough side of town. And she started this way. A couple of years ago, she began, I was into cocaine really big. That stuff makes you do stupid things. She told the women gathered that a few years before, she and her boyfriend, well, they had robbed a gas station. It was simple as taking candy from a baby, she said. But something inside Verlene was screaming, no, no, this isn't right. And that night, her boyfriend, well, he wanted to rob a convenience store as well because the other had been so easy, and she knew it wasn't right. She said, I couldn't do it. I just, I kept saying no inside, and then finally I looked at him, and for the first time in my life I said, no, I'm not doing it. Her boyfriend beat her up so badly that she was in hospital for over two weeks. And she remembered for the group that when she awoke from the surgery that saved her life, she said, I felt so good 
such a relief because for the first time in my life, I'd actually said no to something. The group sat in stunned silence until my colleague muttered, wow, I, I have no words except thank you for sharing that. What courage that must have taken. Temptation is relative. We need to be aware that there are people who are tempted daily with situations that we can't even begin to wrap our heads around. Those people for whom daily survival rests on their ability to choose how or if they will resist. So out in the wilderness, for 40 days, Jesus confronts evil head on. He was tempted, just as we are all tempted. We all face temptation, large and small. The important thing is that when we are tempted, we must face temptation face on. And there's something else to, to consider. We become stronger when we resist temptation. There's something we need to understand about the power of the tempter. The more we give in, the easier it is to give in the next time. The more we resist, the stronger our convictions become. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the wicked queen entices the boy, Edmund, with a box of enchanted Turkish delight. Each piece is sweet and so delicious. There's only one problem. The more he eats of the enchanted Turkish delight, the more he wants. He doesn't know that this is precisely what the wicked queen is planning. The more he eats, the more he wants, and he will eat and eat and eat until it kills him. It will never satisfy his hunger. It will never be enough. It will just kill him. He will even give away his family's safety for more of it. You see, Lewis is giving us a metaphor for sin. This is how sin is. It never satisfies. It only enslaves us. And the primary way to separate yourself from God, and that is what sin is, separation from God, is to give in to that temptation. It's like something that happened when they were renovating the Queen Mary. This gracious old vessel was the largest ship to cross the ocean when it was launched in 1936. And through four decades and a world war, this ocean liner, well, it served its owners very well. Then it was retired to Long Beach, California, where it was anchored as a floating hotel and museum. But during its conversion to its present status, its three massive smokestacks were taken down to be scraped and repainted. But on the dock, these massive pieces of steel crumbled. Nothing was left of three quarters of an inch of steel plate from which the stacks had been made. All that remained were more than 30 coats of paint that had been applied over the years. The rest was just a shell of rust. That's an analogy of what happens to our character if we take the easy way out and give in to temptation all the time. Eventually, our inner moral fiber is eaten away. Fortunately, the opposite is also true. The more times we resist, the easier it is. And anyone who has begun an exercise program or diet, or tried to quit smoking, or tried to live a more active and involved life, knows the hardest part is just simply getting started. The longer we wait to begin, the harder it is to start. But Jesus nipped temptation in the bud with a resounding no right from the beginning. And most importantly, Jesus was not alone in his time of temptation, and neither are we. The psalmist proclaims, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It's interesting that according to Matthew's version, which we didn't read today, Jesus resisted Satan with these words from Deuteronomy, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. 
He was putting Satan on notice that he was not simply confronting a human, but the very power of God. Jesus was not alone in the wilderness. God was with him. And that's something we tend to forget when we're out there in wilderness times and we're struggling. There's a fascinating story that comes out of 1989 earthquake that flattened Armenia, and I'd like to leave you with it today. This deadly tremor killed over 30,000 people in less than four minutes. Imagine. And in the midst of all the confusion of the earthquake, a father left his wife securely at home and rushed to his son's school. When he arrived, he discovered that the building was flattened and that all of the children were still inside. And standing there and looking at what was left of his son's school, the father remembered a promise he had made to his son. No matter what, I will always be there for you. Tears began to fill his eyes. It looked like a helpless situation, but he could not take his mind off his promise. He remembered that his son's classroom was at the back right-hand corner of the building. The father rushed there and started furiously digging through the rubble. And it was, as he was digging, other grieving parents arrived, clutching their hearts and saying, my son, my daughter, and they were grieving. And other well-meaning parents tried to stop him saying, it's too late, my friend. They're gone. They're all gone. And even a police officer and a firefighter told him that they should just go home. To everyone who tried to stop him, he said, are you going to help me? Are you going to help me now? And when they did not answer, he continued digging for his son stone by stone into the night. He needed to know for himself, is my boy alive or is he dead? The man dug for eight hours, and then 12, and then 24, and 36, and on into the next day. And finally, in the 38th hour, as he pulled back a boulder, he heard his son's voice emerging from the rubble. He screamed his son's name, Armand, Armand, is that you? And a weakened voice answered, Dad, Dad, it's me, Dad. And then the boy added these priceless words remembered by a bystander. I told the kids not to worry. I told them if you were alive, you'd save me, and then you'd save each and every one of them. You promised no matter what, you'd be there for me. You did it, Dad. And the father worked intently now, other parents joining in, and before long cleared an opening for the children to escape the rubble. You and I have that same relationship with God. When we come face to face with temptation or whatever obstacle life inevitably throws in our path, God is there. God does not promise to give us special favors or prevent life's sorrows, but promises to be there with us in the midst of them. And that love is unconditional. God never gives up on us, gives us chance after chance to make the right choices to choose a relationship with him. I guarantee you that in life you will be tempted. Nothing is more sure than that. The temptations of life, though, can be subtle. They may not even seem like temptations at all, but they're real, and they confront us every day. And we can respond as Jesus did, knowing that God is there with us. God is always for us. And with God at our back, how can we possibly fail? <laughs> Let's go down 
In each new day, O oh God, you bring us fresh blessings. With grateful hearts, we return to you the first fruits of our labor. We pray that through these offerings, your reign of justice and joy may come quickly and that we may continue to offer what we are able and our best selves to your service.
Let us pray. Ever-present God, in asking you to bless these gifts, we humbly ask that you bless us too. In dedicating our offerings to your work, so we dedicate our lives to you and to following Jesus by serving others. Amen. Our hymn this morning is, O oh Jesus, I Have Promised. It will be printed for you, but if you have a voice as united at home, it's 120. It has been really good to share this second Sunday of Lent with all of you. There's much to reflect on during our Lenten journey this year. Unlike so many other years past, we actually have some time on our hands, perhaps time to reflect and pray. And now leave this place, and let's do that together in peace knowing the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the inspiration and guidance of the Holy Spirit with us on our Lenten journey this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.